Hi, I'm Ali Narvani. I'm one of the shoulder and elbow consultants at Fortius. I specialize in all aspects of shoulder and elbow surgery, in particular sports and arthroscopic procedures. It is a common issue, uh, shoulder pain in, in, in swimmers, and you know there are some papers quoting figures as high as 87% of competitive uh, swimmers will suffer at some stage from a disabling shoulder pain. What are the pathologies we're dealing with? Well, yes, they do get all the other pathologies that everyone else gets, such as long of bicep abnormalities, rotator cuff tears, labral tears, ACJ pain, and uh, arthritis osacromiali. But by far, the main um, issue is supraspinatus tendinopathy and impingement in the vast, vast, vast majority of the patients, okay? Now, this is the problem with the shoulder and it's emphasized in swimmers probably more than, it's more the case with swimmers than other groups. Mm -hmm. The problem with shoulders is condition A can lead to condition B, which can lead to condition C. And if you just focus on condition C without addressing condition A, and treat condition C, you won't be de doing any of that patient any good. You gotta deal, you gotta look for the primary condition and address that. Primary impingement is the commonest condition, primary impingement is the commonest condition that we surgeons treat with arthroscopic subacromial decompression. Okay? But it's probably not as common as we think it is. And it is important that when you get particularly young patients who you think they have impingements, try to look for other causes that are leading to secondary impingements. And you know, there's a whole wide range of things. I do apologize from, uh, uh, this is quite a busy slide, but inadequate uh, muscular stabilizations of scapula, glenohumeral instability, muscle imbalance, these all can lead to impingement. And if you don't address these and just address the impingement, then you, won't, you probably won't have happy patients, okay? Um, so let's go back to the impingement. So we, yes, primary tendinopathy, primary impingement, yes, but there are also secondary tendinopathy impingements. And in order to look at these, we've got to consider the technique, you know, the muscular fatigue, laxity, and other issues that can lead to these secondary uh, tendinopathies. Why is tendinopathy, supraspinatus tendinopathy, so common in, in swimmers? Well, in particular in competitive swimmers. This is a white heart lane, okay? I don't particularly, I don't support Tottenham, but I, don't, I have no, nothing against people who do. But the reason I'm showing you this slide is that the capacity of white heart lane is 30,000 uh, people, okay? And that's the number of rotations a competitive swimmer will make in a week, all right? 30,000 rotations. So if you, you know, a competitive swimmer will swim between 60 to 80,000 meters per week. And if you calculate it with a typical count of eight to 10 strokes per 25 square meters, it comes to approximately 30,000 rotations in one week, all right? So there's a huge uh, stress on the shoulders, which can result in repetitive micro trauma. Damage to the tendons and damage to the cells can lead to tendinopathy and impingement, all right? And if you actually look at uh, the evidence, the number of ORs swum appears to be directly linked to you know, the frequency of uh, supraspinatus tendinopathy. So that appears to be a direct link between how hard they train and how often supraspinatus tendinopathy occurs. Let's look at freestyle. You know, I can cover everything, but you know, we are limited in time, so I'm just going to cover freestyle, which is probably the commonest uh, stroke uh, with shoulder issues. We can, broadly speaking, we can divide a freestyle stroke into three phases, a hand entry, a pull through, 
uh, phase where the water is in the end and actually it's the most important uh, phase because you're basically pulling, the athlete is pulling the body over uh, the water in the pull through uh, phase. Um, and then the hand exit followed by recovery. Okay? So these are the three main phases in a uh, freestyle stroke. 70% of the symptoms are felt in the first half of the pull through. Okay, this phase where the athlete is generating a lot of forces to pull the water, uh, to pull the body over, uh, over the, you know, over to, to make it, it's the engine phase of, of the stroke. And during this phase, in the pull through phase, the scapula is prot uh, protracted while the humerus is adducted, extended, and internally rotated. <coughs> and the power is achieved through the adductors, extens extenders of the shoulders, and internal rotators, such as the serratus and anterior, the latissimus, subscapulari. Okay, so these are the main muscles in that pull through phase where uh, the most injuries are most common and pain is felt more often. As these muscles fatigue, athletes get, swimmers get pain. Also additionally, these muscles stabilize the scapula and as they fatigue and uh, they're not working as efficiently, the scapula is not moving in an uh, efficient way and they get secondary impingement. Okay? So it becomes a sort of a vicious circle. Look at, if you look at the uh, technique and some of the abnormal techniques uh, in a bit more detail. So, drop the elbow uh, during the pull through. So in a normal, uh, correct position during the pull through, the elbow is much higher than the wrist uh, and uh, the hand. An incorrect position, if you look at that, the position of the elbow is lower than what it is here. And the hand and the wrist are slightly higher than that. Okay? That puts all the muscles that I've talked about uh, at a disadvantage. They're lengthened, they're at a disadvantage, they're not at their optimal contraction length. So it's more likely that they will fatigue earlier. Okay, and this is a very common uh, mistake uh, in, in, in the freestyle. Similarly, in the recovery phase, again, the correct position of the elbow is above the hand and wrist. This is called a dropped elbow during recovery. You can see the elbow is below the hand and the wrist. And what this leads to is an upward force on the humerus. Okay, as the, as the uh, arm touches the water, there's an upward, uh, upward force on the humerus, which causes a superior translation and secondary impingement. Right. Again, this is not an uncommon uh, finding in, in, uh, in swimmers with shoulder pain. Head carrying angle. Uh, the head during the pull through should be in the water, should not be looking forward. As you look forward, in this case, because of the muscles that you use to extend your neck, you're preventing it, you're tightening the scapula and you're preventing the scapula from moving in its normal way. Therefore, again, leading, if the scapula is not mobilizing in the normal way, it, again, that can lead to a secondary impingement as well. So these are the things that one should look for when one's faced uh, with swimmers with shoulder pain. Hand entry position, uh, hand entry position. So in a, no, a correct hand entry would be the hand enters somewhere between the head and the shoulder, okay? It shouldn't enter here, it shouldn't enter lateral to the shoulder, it shouldn't enter near the head. It should be somewhere between that. A medial hand entry 
is, is very common. All right, and if you look at this position, this is not too dissimilar to the Hawking's test that we do for impingement. So this is an impingement position. Yeah? So again, one should look for this. <laughs> the way the hand enters the water, you know, whether you bring in, uh, whether all the fingers touch the water initially, or whether you're going in with a thumb. So uh, the correct position is all the fingers entering the water, not the thumb. The thumb enters later. Whereas an incorrect position would be you know, rotating your uh, forearm with that thumb entering. And this produces excessive forces to uh, where the superior, where the long lateral bicep attaches to the superior labrum. And it can cause damage down there. Again, during the pull through, if you look at the position uh, uh, of the arm, a, in a correct position would be a straight arm as opposed to a bent elbow down here. And again, this is not too dissimilar to the Hawking's test that you do. Again, so again, it's sort of impingement type thing. Additionally, in order to increase the resistance, a lot of swimmers, competitive swimmers, are encouraged to practice with hand pedals. And that also has the result of increased forces on, on the shoulder, structure of the shoulder, therefore increasing the likelihood of, of injuries and tendinopathies. Most of the swimmers have a increased thoracic kyphosis and a, a hyperlordosis of lower back, okay? And that also leads to uh, a scapula dyskinesia and a reduced and secondary impeachment as a result of reduced subacromial space. Uh, it has been shown that swimmers, and also it's not only swimmers, but also uh, throwers, have a lax anterior capsule as compared to the uh, posterior structure. And hyperlaxity, mild anterior hyperlaxity, can in turn lead to mechanical, uh, secondary mechanical impeachment as well. Now this is, uh, Essentially, this is a tight posterior inferior capsule. It's very popularized in, in America. It's, they, they refer it to it as glenohumeral internal rotation deficit. And they get it quite often with baseball throwers. And basically what happens as a result of repetitive hyper extension and abduction, as with throwers, the capsule posteriorly becomes tight. Because of the tight posterior capsule, the humerus is pushed anteriorly and superiorly, and it causes secondary internal impingement. Uh, and also, uh, it may also, in, in worse cases, cause damage to the rotator cuff with partial thickness tears of the rotator cuff and also superior labor of slap lesions. And again, the treatment with this is not actually jumping in and repairing the cuff or the slap lesion, it's actually by trying to address the tight posterior, uh, posterior inferior capsule. Okay. How often do we see these arrows, these by uh, technical arrows in competitive uh, swimmers? Well, quite often. This is not a. Uh, the, uh, this is a recent recent article, and it looked at uh, videos of thirty you know, American college uh, swimmers, both under and uh, over the water. Uh, and, you know, these are 61% uh, of the swimmers had a dropped elbow uh, posture during the pull through. Uh, again, over 50% had a dropped elbow during their recovery phase. And what they also reported that you know, it was quite common to 
to see a combination of these abnormalities together. So it, it, is, it is quite common. You see them quite often common. And also this is then other issues. You know, swimmers, competitive swimmers, think that shoulder pain is part of their thing. They think that it's normal. Uh, and a lot of them put up with it and they, they do not address it and it just gets worse and worse and worse. This is a you know, big, big issue. So looking at everything that we discuss, etiological factors, we can divide them into intrinsic and intrinsic, fa intrinsic factors. E extrinsic factors include you know, the training volume, technical errors, perhaps hand paddlers, whereas intrinsic factors include things like general hyperlaxity, uh, thoracic kyphosis, posture, scapula uh, dyskinesia, tight posterior inferior capsule, rotator cuff, uh, imbalance and lack of general lack of flexibility. Okay, and uh, this is a paper in 2010 which actually divided swimmers uh, with shoulder pain into categories. And he said that you know they, they said that the best way to treat them is by dividing them into categories. So there are five main types: type A or one. These are pay those uh, who have primary impingement and mechanical impingement. Type B, it was those with uh, internal impingement or a reduced uh, uh, internal rotation, uh, the tight posterior inferior capsule. Type C, they said this is where uh, you have a, a combination of A and B. Type D are those with hyperlaxity. And type A, E, uh, he, they grouped everyone else. So what should be our strategies to manage these patients? Prevention is the main thing and then uh, treatment. Prevention actually is a lot easier than, than when uh, they actually have the issue. Uh, so you know one should take uh, prevention more seriously and it involves recognizing the incorrect technique as mentioned before extensive programs of stretching, strengthening, endurance uh, training, and then careful monitoring uh, of training as well, as well as ad addressing uh, you know, the, the other muscles, core, core muscles. Treatment, well, again, you know, the same correction of the poor technique, adjustment of the training volume and intensity, looking for primary reasons, and managing the primary uh, causes uh, of impingement, physical therapy, maybe a course of non steroidal anti-inflammatories, injection, surgery. Uh, you know, your, your input uh, comes in initial modalities and physical therapies to address pain, trying to correct the posture, try to correct the tight anterior chest wall, uh, try to address the hypermobility of the thoracic spine. Try to address uh, those with excessive la uh, joint mobility and a tight posterior inferior capsule, general rotator cuff uh, and prescapular balance and strengthening are the issues that one needs to look at. And the last, you know, if they don't respond, then surgery in the form of subacral decompression. <coughs> so uh, what could divide uh, the phases uh, of shoulder pain in, in swimmers into three? Phase one, this is our patients who get pain only at the time of swimming, okay? And you could manage this with a slight period of rest, reduced training, ice packs, correction of, you know, looking, analyzing their technique and trying to correct them, trying to address the instability of the core and scapula, exercises directed towards the specific dysfunction, trying to address a tight posterior inferior capsule. Phase two are those patients who also get pain when they're not swimming. And again, everything you do in phase one plus a longer rest probably from swimming, non steroidal anti-inflammatories, and you may consider sending the patients for an injection. But you know, only one, 
I don't believe in giving more than injection, more than one injection, because you know you can do more damage than than good. That's my mentality. And phase three is if, despite uh, managing patients with phase uh, in phase two, if that hasn't helped at all, and if that has you know if they have been symptomatic for more than three months and then you do everything in phase and one and then you consider surgery and it's surgery it depends on how you classify those patients so in uh, type one where there was a uh, mechanical primary impingement you consider the decompression type b you may consider repairing the labor room repairing the uh, partial thickness there as well as addressing the tight posterior inferior capsule type c was a mixture of both uh, intrinsic and in intrinsic impingement so you can do a mixture of both type D were the instability type hyperlaxity types which you may want to consider uh, capsule application and type E was this other bag with the other host of uh, conditions which you, you can address with surgery each one of those conditions so in summary shoulder pain is common swimmers okay Technical error is also common, even in you know, high-level competitor swimmers. Best treatment is prevention. A treatment is mainly non-operative. Okay? 